Sarah had always been the dependable friend in the church, the one everyone turned to for advice and support. She prided herself on her ability to analyze situations and offer practical solutions. But lately, her friend, Mia, had been going through a rough patch that left Sarah feeling completely out of her depth. Mia seemed to oscillate between episodes of extreme guilt on one hand and cynical irritability on the other. She would confide in Sarah about feeling spiritually lost, questioning who God is. Her prayer life was struggling. I just don't know if I have the power to change, Mia would lament, and I don't know where God is either. Sarah would listen attentively, trying to offer words of encouragement and advice about surrendering her struggles to God in prayer and finding strength from Him. Yet, as Sarah delved deeper into Mia's struggle, she couldn't shake the feeling that something deeper was at play. Mia's emotional turmoil seemed to stem from past traumas that she hadn't fully processed. There were moments when Mia would recount painful memories, her voice quivering with raw emotion. I feel like I'm just a victim of everything that's happened to me. Mia would lament. Sarah found herself torn between wanting to support Mia's journey towards spiritual and moral clarity as a sister in the church on one hand, and then recognizing the deep emotional wounds that Mia carried on the other. She began to wonder if Mia's problems were more about healing from past hurts than summoning willpower to change. But she couldn't help but wonder if her friend's spiritual life, the area that she was responsible for, was truly healthy and that there wasn't some way she could encourage her to grow in these areas of weakness. Situations like this are increasingly common in the church today. The complexity of moral and biblical issues where someone has responsibility to change on one hand, and mental, emotional um, issues that people are beholden to, that they don't have control over the interplay between those, those two. Perhaps you've experienced the frustration of being a counselor in that set situation, or the frustration of being the counselee. The title of my talk today is Equipping the Church, Counseling Others in the Ways of the Kingdom. Today I will demonstrate four key principles in effective biblical counseling. First, that all Christians are charged to the vital role of common counseling. I will define what I mean by common biblical counseling and differentiate it from other forms of biblical counseling. Second, the necessity of common counseling in the church. Third, effective biblical counseling requires humility, peace, and patience. It's three virtues we'll unpack. And fourth, the role of ministerial counseling in the church. And this is a unique type of counseling that requires wisdom, giftings, expertise, and we'll unpack that today. So again, all Christians are charged to the vital role of common counseling, the necessity of common counseling in the church, effective biblical counseling requires humility, peace, and patience, these three virtues, and then lastly, the role of ministerial counseling in the church. So first, what is biblical counseling? Simply put, it's guidance in line with the scriptures. To counsel is to guide. And biblical means that it's in line with the patterns in the scriptures. You know, and functionally, in the New Testament, there are a variety of ways to capture counseling. Um, and this range, ranges from more passive forms of counseling to more direct confrontational forms. So, on, on the far hand, perhaps more passive, but still important, is encouragement. This would be saying to Mia, Mia, I see you and I know you. Uh, you're going through a hard time. Stay with it. Keep up the fight. Moving up the scale to more direct would be exhortation, where we ought to exhort one another today as long as it's called today. Um, and this is more of a directed encouragement uh, to continue in the ways of, of the Lord. Moving up the scale to even more direct, it is admonishment. And this is counseling with a push. This is seeing a pattern in someone's life that is leading them towards sin, or perhaps they're even in sin, and, and saying, stop. So this would be counseling Mia to say, hey, Mia, I see this pattern in your prayer life, or in your relationships, or in your marriage, and I want to help you um, not go down this path. 
And then the, the far end of the most direct form of counseling would be a rebuke, saying stop it. There's a clear pattern of sin um, that's been consistent, and it, it's saying stop. So all of these are biblical counseling, but the scriptures des describe how to do that in many different ways, from encouragement on one hand to a rebuke on the other. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll see how these forms of counseling demonstrate themselves in the scriptures. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11. I'll be reading from the ESV. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. Let's pray. Righteous Father, we, we come to you today because we are in desperate need of being competent to counsel. I pray that you would unfold your scriptures in power and clarity and you would nourish your church through this time. I pray this in the mighty name of our shepherd, our guide, our king, in Jesus' name. Amen. In my professional background, um, I have studied and published scientific papers that review the entirety of the research on a certain disease, and specifically on treatments um, of a disease. And an example of how you do this is you would take 100 papers on the tr treatment of disease X, and you would ask, what are the trends in these treatments? You're not looking at any one paper, but you're asking the large scope, what, what are the treatments that work? What are the treatments that don't work as well? What are the side effects? How often should we use these treatments? And so when you do this type of review, you can scan the entirety of a topic and come together with a, a synthesis of, of the trend of where these, these treatments are, are pointing people. The past few weeks, I've applied this same methodology to the New Testament epistles, asking the question to review, one, what is biblical counseling? And specifically, what are the different forms of biblical counseling um, taught by the apostles? And so this is from Romans to Revelation with a keen focus on the pastoral sections of the epistles. So um, in, at the end of Romans, at the end of Colossians, Ephesians, Paul um, shifts from dense theological arguments about the covenant, about grace, the law, and he, he shifts into pastoral application. And, and so I had a keen focus on these passages, specifically studying not direct commandments about being holy or being righteous, individual commandments, but studying the commandments where there's relationship, where there's uh, counsel to guide people in their relationships with one another. In other words, when is Paul counseling on how to counsel? And the findings of the study were extremely illuminating for myself. So I found that in, the, in addition to the forms of counseling I mentioned, that there are really two layers of counseling, or levels. And the, the thing that distinguishes them is the level of wisdom, expertise, or gifting needed to carry them out. So the base type of counseling that Paul, and mainly Paul talks about in the scriptures, I'm gonna call, he doesn't call it this, but functionally and practically, common counseling. Now the more expert form that requires wisdom, giftings, experience, age, is ministerial counseling. These are func functional buckets that will help organize these scriptures. Okay, so what are some examples from this review? First, let's start with common counseling. Again, this is the baseline counseling that everyone in this room is capable to do. I'm just going to read some off. And I want you to listen for the trends here. What's the thrust of what Paul and the other writers are getting at? Galatians, bear one another's burdens. Ephesians and Colossians, bear with one another. Do not lie to one another. Forgive one another. Put on love. Address one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs. Thessalonians. We'll be unpacking Thessalonians as a model of these. Encourage one another. Build one another up. Be patient towards all. Hebrews. Exhort one another daily. Consider how to stir one another up towards love and good works. 
do not neglect meeting, but encourage one another. The Apostle Peter, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil. James, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, confess to one another, pray for one another. And then lastly, the Apostle John, in his three letters, has a consistent thread of love for one another as the ultimate way of, of living out the Christian life. So in sum, this form of common counseling, or this way of relating to one another and giving one another guidance, has something to do with this picture of bearing one another's burdens, encouraging one another, building one another up, being patient with one another, forgiving one another. And you can see how all of these capture this general disposition of love, patience, kindness, forgiveness towards the brotherhood. And these are the ways of counseling that everyone can and must do for the church to be healthy. And and that leads to my first point. All Christians are charged to the vital role of common counseling. As I was thinking about an analogy to capture this common counseling versus ministerial counseling dynamic, I think it's helpful to turn to medicine. In medicine, there are really two forms of health care. There's general health care, and then there's a, more of an expert-based health care. So general health care is things that are proactive. They take care of the chronic issues of your life. Diet, exercise, being in community with others, not being lonely. All of these... Everyone can help one another to grow in those ways. It doesn't take a PhD or a medical doctorate to say, hey, how can we help each other in our diets and our exercise? This is general counseling that is essential to health. Now, there are times when illnesses arise, like a high blood pressure or diabetes, that, that need more than this general health care. They require an expertise, an expert-based health care. It requires perhaps administering the right medication at the right dose. And it, again, it requires training, a skill set, wisdom to administer this form of health care. And that's a way to capture, again, general health care being this common counseling that we are all capable of doing from this ministerial form of counseling, which requires skill sets and wisdoms that comes from a combination of experience, spiritual insight through prayer and scripture, as well as giftings and, and intuition. It's knowing what the diagnosis is in a complex situation and and then what the right spiritual treatment is. So for Mia, is she idle, as the Apostle Paul says? Does she need admonishment? Or is she depressed? Now, distinguishing between those two is is rather challenging and it requires someone with experience. So that would be a form of ministerial counseling is meeting her in that way. Now, a form of common counseling towards Mia is something everyone, everyone in the church could do to her, for her. They could bring her meals, but they could also listen, hear, be patient with her when she's frustrating to deal with, forgive her when she's irritable or anxious. Um, again, that common form of counseling is a form that everyone is capable of doing. The ministerial counseling uh, passages would, would be more specific, and, and I'm not going to run through the whole list, but it generally has to do with Paul putting someone in a category such as divisive, or um, in sin, or perhaps a marital dynamic, or fathers and sons. It's these specific categories that require a specific spiritual response and treatment by the community. And in order to, to give the right response, it requires knowing what category people are in. And again, this would all be forms of ministerial counseling. A key passage would be in Colossians. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Requiring wisdom. In Jude, Jude says, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire of uh, the divisiveness in the church there. And to all have mercy with fear. So these are these categories. Are they doubting? No. Are they, are they in the fire? And, and you see how it requires knowing where someone's at and then providing the right treatment. Now, let's turn our attention back to our model passage, 1 Thessalonians 5. Verse 11, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Anytime there's a a therefore in Scripture, we should ask the question, what is the therefore? Therefore, exactly. In other words, what is the preceding argument 
what is the preceding context leading up to this, therefore, encourage one another, build one another up. In other words, why should they encourage one another? Why should they build one another up? So when we look back at chapter 5, Paul likens the coming of the Lord and the day of salvation to three different metaphors. It'll be like the pains of labor that suddenly come on a pregnant woman. And therefore, we ought to be children of light and not children of darkness. And then he finishes with this metaphor, mixing it awake, being awake versus asleep. Um, in verse 6, I'll read it. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. And since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that when, whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, build one another up, and encourage one another, just as you are doing. So the conclusion on the therefore, what's it there for? It's to encourage one another and build one another up to avoid spiritual idleness and, and drunkenness specifically here, to avoid spiritual lethargy, not being prepared for the Lord's coming judgment, and lastly, not to neglect their salvation. In other words, this, this counseling of encouraging and building one another, which is a common form of counseling, anyone can do it, is a vital part of walking in the ways of salvation. In other words, the stakes are high. And, and so if the stakes are so high, and, and I'm saying everyone's supposed to do it, this, you, you may be thinking, wow, to really counsel others in the ways of God's salvation. I don't want to mess that up. I don't know how to do that. I don't have the skill set. I didn't, I didn't get any training in biblical counseling. No, 1 Thessalonians was the first epistle written by the Apostle Paul. As a brief review, on Paul's second missionary journey, he was in um, modern-day Turkey, which was Asia at the time, where he received the Macedonian call. He crosses over the Aegean Sea to, to modern-day Greece, and he goes to Philippi. The jailer's converted. He goes to Thessalonica, and he's there for, it says he's there for three Sabbaths, reasoning with the, with the Jews there. Some Greeks are converted, as well as Jews. He's forced to flee. He goes to Berea, and finally he lands himself in Corinth for a year and a half. And during this time in Corinth, on, on Paul's second missionary journey, he writes, he pens the first epistle, and that's 1 Thessalonians, what, we're, what we just read. And from Acts 17, where we know this context, Paul was there for three Sabbaths. That means Paul was with this church for less than a month before he was kicked out. Now we also know from this letter that Paul had sent Timothy um, to encourage the church and had come back and sent him a positive report. But Paul is penning this letter at most two years after spending a month with them. And what does he say? Verse 11. Encourage one another, build one another up, one another up just as you are already doing. As you are already doing. How did Paul see what they were already doing? How did he see that they were already encouraging one another and building one another up? You know, Paul and Timothy, in his report, must have noticed something in the Christians there. They don't have the New Testament, they don't even have the Scriptures yet. They don't have books on counseling. What are they doing? How do they know how to, how to encourage one another? Turn back with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers through Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. Why? For you yourselves have been taught by God himself to love one another. So in sum, less, less than two years at the most into their Christian life, 
they are competent to counsel one another because God himself has shown them what love is. God himself has taught them what encouragement is, what it means to be built up in the Holy Spirit. And based on that, he's saying, you 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 are continuing, you are already doing this. As a medical student, I had the privilege of training at the Menninger. It's one of the top psychiatric hospitals in the country in Houston. And before starting, I was very intrigued. And the main reason why is because not only being it's a top psychiatric hospital, but they don't accept insurance. And so what that means is all treatment there is out of pocket, cash pay. The average length of stay at this inpatient hospital is eight weeks, two months. One week of treatment costs $10,000. So I was intrigued. I I said, what are people paying $80,000 for? The top psychiatric care in the country. So upon arrival to the inpatient unit, I learned about many different modes of psychiatric treatment. There was medication management by the psychiatrist, but there was also substance use counseling. It's very common in mental illness for people to struggle with substance use. Uh, Physical therapy, exercise, dietitians. There was individual counselors, PhD psychologists that had decades of training and experience. Lastly, there was group therapy. And so one day I asked one of the therapists on the unit, I said, you know, of all the forms of treatment here, which do you think is the most effective? Like, where, where do people find breakthrough? And she looked at me and she said, Seth, you should go to the group therapy and sit in. So I went, and these are groups of five to ten patients led by one facilitator, and it's not rocket science what they were doing. The facilitator would open up a question, and then one of the patients would share. When I was younger, this is how my mother would treat me, and this is how it made me feel. There'd be a pause, and someone would ask a question, tell me more about that. And then finally, another person would say, you know, that same thing happened to me. And this is what I've learned about myself from it. This is how I relate to my mother now. And I saw healing, I saw breakthrough in these moments. You know, all the expertise and the resources at one of these top hospitals in the country, getting people just in a group and facilitating a few questions was leading leading to deep emotional and mental healing. Context, this was around the time that I joined the church here. I was experiencing a fresh model of New Testament discipleship where we were you know, gathering weekly, breaking bread with one another, examining ourselves, but also sharing our burdens in our, in our agape times, and confessing sin, opening up our lives to one another. And I, I'll never forget one Sunday, I had a light bulb moment. I said, wow, the common grace that God is giving to healing people in their mental and emotional struggles through these groups when we just follow the scriptures, that this same power is being, but the, but in the spiritual realm, is being unleashed in our lives. But, and brother, brothers and sisters, even, even more than sharing experiences of mental and emotional pain, which is a good thing, it's good that people heal that way, we get to share in the ultimate reality. We have known the love of the living God. And you know what that means? That means when someone's in distress in your church, when someone's in temptation, when someone's fearful and confused, that you get to look back and you say, you say, how has God met me in that place? How has He loved me? I know the love of the living God. I have been baptized into Him and I have His Holy Spirit. And you get to share that with your brothers and sisters. This is the ultimate reality, brothers and sisters. And we get to partake in that life together. This is what Paul means. Concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourself have been taught by God to love one another.
you know, and this type of, this is a type of common counseling where you share in the love God has taught you. It's not passive. Common does not mean passive. It, it's a form of treating others the way that you have already been treated by God. It requires reflection. It's very easy to go into agape or go into a discipleship meeting and leave and say, wow, people are struggling and broken. And then to go about your day. It's very easy to do that. And that, that's, that's a, there's a temptation to do that. But you know what's challenging is listening, actively listening to your brothers and sisters and saying, wow, how have I been in that situation and how has God helped me? How can I encourage them in this moment? And I imagine when you reflect on those moments, perhaps your breakthrough has come through prayer by yourself or reading a scripture, but I imagine God has met you through the community. And, and what your job is, is then to be that hand of God to that other person, to be the extension of the body of Christ through counseling, through guidance, through encouragement, through building one another up. And, and we are do, I agree with Paul, just as you are already doing. This is already happening in our churches. I've seen it happen. I've experienced breakthrough in my own life, overcoming sin, having a new vision of my role in the kingdom, cast in these places. And, and what I'm calling you today is activate yourself in this role. Do this role. Embrace this role. It is vital for the health and sustenance of the church. So in sum, that's point one, that all Christians are charged to the vital role of common counseling highlighting it's all Christians' job because all Christians have known the love of God. You can then share that love with others and that it's vital, it's necessary for walking in the pathway of salvation. That leads to my second point. Common counseling requires humility, peace, and patience. It's three virtues. First, humility. Turn to... Verse 12. Now, this is after the therefore build one another up just as well. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. You know, as I mentioned earlier, this is the first epistle written. From Acts 17, we know this is a diverse church of both Jews and Gentiles. It says even some of the lead, leading women of the Greeks converted. So you just get a picture of this church. Paul had spent no more than a month there. Timothy had visited. And what does Paul say? He says, Paul says, there are those that are laboring amongst you. And that you ought to esteem them highly in love. I don't know if there were elders appointed at this time. We can speculate, but I imagine not. Regardless, what were these? What set, separated the leaders as leaders is that they were laboring amongst them. They were admonishing them. It says, "Brothers and sisters, we have older men in our midst that have labored for the sake of the gospel to much." cost to themselves, to their families, to their reputations. They've given up, up much to labor and admonish the church. And, you know, we, we are a young church, and when I read this letter and you think of this context, how, how, how are we embracing this? Are we esteeming highly those who are laboring over us? One, are we esteeming them highly? Two, is, are our lives open to admonishment? You know, many people have benefited from counseling outside of the local church. You know, from Christian biblical counselors in another setting to uh, Christian psychologists to even secular psychologists and psychiatrists and when you compare counseling within the church versus outside the church there are pros and cons to each and I want to highlight that they aren't mutually exclusive they should run together first you know outside the church counseling one of the advantages that that people will know is that it's objective it's a blank slate you don't have the weighted 
cost of like your reputation within the community. You can come to someone that doesn't know your context, your place, your family, and you can just bear what is on your soul. They can gather all this data and give you some feedback and, and then get a treatment plan going. So it's objective, and people like that, and I think that's, that's good in the right context. And often an, another benefit is there's specific training and expertise. But this, this blank slate idea, this objectivity, while it has upsides, it also has downsides. It's often short-sighted. Hey, it was eight weeks, we're gonna meet once a week, we're gonna give you some tools, and then we'll move on. It also doesn't have the complete picture of your life. The, the ecosystem that your marriage is in, that your children are in, that your life is in, that your work is in. All of these enmeshed systems we have as a communal church that a counselor doesn't see and therefore can't leverage those things or even point to those things as places for growth. And, and so inside the church counseling, it, it's not objective, it's very subjective. It's like a family. If, if your brother or sister is hurting in your family, you, you don't just see their hurt, you, say, you see who they were in the past, you see how they hurt you a few years ago, you see their weaknesses, you see their strengths. It's not objective in that sense. But Paul uses the word brethren five times here in these final 15 verses of Thessalonians. I think that family feel is okay. I, don't, I, don't think, I think that subjectivity isn't a bad thing. Because the church has stake. They have skin in the game. If you go to a counselor and you go through eight weeks and you don't make any progress, all that's hurt is maybe a review that you'll write and a professional relationship. If you go through counseling within the church and your mental, emotional, but mainly your spiritual life, your, your ability to overcome sin and your ability to love your, your, your family and love the brotherhood is in shambles, that has a weight to the church. On top of this, the unique family atmosphere underlying counseling within the church, the, the, the church knows the values of the kingdom. The outside guidance will not be built on. An, an example of this is marriage counseling. Outside of the church, you'll get some communication skills. You'll learn about your family of origin that each spouse came from, and those are all important things to learn. But when you do counseling, marriage counseling in the church, you have the foundation of a covenant made before the living God. You have the foundation of knowing that separation and division in your relationship will lead to divorce and spiritual death. And you have the foundation of knowing that, hey, your marriage is going to affect your ministry, affect your children. The stakes are much higher in the church. And so with this in mind, church leaders ought to step up to that and say, wow, the responsibility is great. But then it also, on the other hand, it requires the openness of the church to that admonishment, to that guidance. And I wanna, this isn't a condemning thing. This should inspire us to our lives being open so that we don't go down pathways that destroy us. Our blind spots being open is the most liberating thing. It, it's what excite, one of the things that excites me most about our church model is that your blind spots are only hidden if you want them to be hidden. And so what does it mean, church, to esteem church leaders very highly in love because of their work? Meaning their work ought to be the litmus test of their faithfulness. And if they're working well and they're working in the way that Christ has loved the church with humility, with grace, with kindness, then we then ought to come under that, as a church does, and submit. It's, it's loving authority and glad submission. It's a beautiful dynamic. And according, get this, according to the Apostle Paul, it's the foundation from which all other counseling happens. Notice in verse 14. And we urge you, brothers, these are the same brothers who were just told by Paul to... to to receive admonishment, to admonish the idol. Those who are receiving admonishment from leaders in the church are now admonishing the idol. It's the beautiful ripple effect of when there's order in the, in the household of God, these ministries, these functions, 
If we think of the river analogy that Brother Finney pointed to, the river is able to flow. Discipleship can happen. So the principle is that receiving admonishment humility and respecting and loving leadership allows you to see clearly and then admonish others. Think back to Mia's case, Mia and Sarah. If Sarah, as her counselor, has her only spiritual inputs as books that she reads on counseling, as Bible studies in the morning, as time of prayer, and then one or two meetings with the church a week, um, do you think her counseling will be effective? What tools does she have? I mean, it, it's, it's, gonna, it's, not gonna, it's not gonna bear the way of this communal enterprise that we're all going down the same r- river together, we're all in this together, and hey, let's fight this together. Without that communal way, Counseling loses its gravitas. So that's virtue number one. The second virtue is peace. So first, humility is the first virtue that's required for counseling. Peace is the next. Verse 13. Be at peace among yourselves. For for over two years, a war has been raging in Ukraine because of Russia's invasion. Research is now being published on the effects of the war on individuals with chronic medical conditions. So high blood pressure, hypertension, easily treatable conditions. Quote, people with chronic diseases are at high risk of becoming innocent victims of the Russian-Ukraine war. Owing to interruption of their health care, more than 10 million Ukrainian people have left their homes and almost 5 million have left the country. They go on. The war events in Ukraine not only changed the life of every Ukrainian, but also had a significant impact on the dynamics and structure of chronic somatic diseases. In in particular, due to an increase in patient referrals for hypertensive crisis, so uncontrolled hypertension, exacerbations of type 2 diabetes, somaticized disorders from trauma, and chronic pain syndromes of unknown etiology. They go on, considering these results, it is important to increase the equipment of regional primary care centers with antihypertensive, hypoglycemic, and sedative drugs. War has wreaked havoc on the ability for a country to have the infrastructure to offer basic health care. These are basic diseases that need basic treatments. Imagine a cancer screening that could have been caught from a general appointment, going months and then even a year without being detected. It's stage four terminal death. All because of the war. Be at peace among yourselves, says Paul. In the same way that war has ravaged the health infrastructure of Ukraine, The chaos and the divisiveness in the church the past two years has wreaked havoc on the ability for the church to offer basic counseling. This this really grieves me. I have observed young men struggle with lust because of a loss of accountability. I've seen questions about the future and uncertainty of the church cause friction and tension in marriages. I've seen children of families become disillusioned, asking how could this happen in a church? There's been a loss of the common leverage of our communion tables, an inability to examine one another and examine each other. There's a reason why why strife sowing and divisiveness, things that break peace, are so heavily weighted against in the scriptures, in the early church. And one of the reasons where Paul says, be at peace among yourselves in the middle of these, it's receive admonishment, encouragement, and then on the back end, more counseling instructions. In the middle, be at peace among yourselves is because the infrastructure for doing the counseling has been been severely damaged. Long-term chronic issues, spiritual issues, have gone unchecked 
They've lost accountability. The common means of grace that we have in the church have lost their, their potency and it's led to spiritual ruin. Much more could be said on that point, but I'll end there. That's the second virtue. So common counseling requires humility, peace, and the third virtue is patience towards all. Now, going from the uh, growing up in the evangelical, the, like the normal American evangelical church model to intensive life-on-life -life discipleship in accordance with the Acts 2 model, you know, has, has great benefits. And one of them, and most, a lot of people don't see it as a benefit, is friction. Now, friction can turn really bad, but friction can be a positive thing because it can lead to growth. Yep. So think back to the common counseling scriptures. Bear with one another, forgive one another, love one another. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Counseling in all of these situations that friction comes up, I mean, there's so many examples, but it requires a deep level of patience. Patience is a virtue that, that is needed there. Uh, for sake of time, we'll move on. So those are our three virtues. That leads to my fourth and final point, the role of ministerial counseling in the church. As a reminder of what ministerial counseling, lit, counseling is and how it's different from common counseling, ministerial counseling requ requires expertise and wisdom, often training, but it could come from age and gifting within the church. Teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, as it says in Colossians. Let's read verse 14 in that context. So be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. If someone is idle, and think of the context, the coming of the day of the Lord, being awake, not asleep, being a children of light, not a children of day. If someone is idle, they're... They're choosing a life of, of sin. They're neglecting faithfulness to God. And so we contrast that here with someone who's faint-hearted. Is someone who's, who's faint-hearted, are they willfully neglecting faithfulness to God? No. They're faint-hearted. If you're running a marathon, you get, you get weary. So faint-heartedness is a product of, of tethering on the journey towards Christ circumstances come and you become faint-hearted. So think of these two diagnostic buckets. It says idle on one hand and then faint-hearted on the other. What is the treatment for being idle, according to the Apostle Paul? Look in the scriptures there. Admonish, yeah. If, if someone is idle, they ought to be admonished. It's counseling with pushing into their life about their idleness. But what's the treatment for someone that's faint-hearted? Encouragement. Now, admonishment and encouragement, that's very, those are very different treatments. And one of the roles of the ministerial counselor is to make sure to distinguish between is someone idle or are they faint-hearted? But, so, but what's, the, what's the line between idleness and faint-heartedness? You know, take Mia's case. And food, food for thought. Is she, is she purposefully neglecting her prayer life because she is idle? meaning she is choosing to forego her responsibilities before God? Or is she faint-hearted? Is she growing weary in her spiritual life because of circumstances in her life outside of her control, outside of her ability to choose? You know, and, and when it comes to being faint-hearted, there's many circumstances that can lead to faint-heartedness. There's general loss of loved ones, stress at work, stress with family, but then there's temptation, trials, as our lives continue in the kingdom. There's also mental illness. Mental illness makes many people faint-hearted. And one way to capture mental illness, I learned this two weeks ago, is that the, at the core of mental illness, it's, it's a time when someone's insight is impaired and their judgment is impaired, leading to a moment of deep vulnerability. 
So first, their insight, their ability to understand themselves, their insight into what's going on, into their life, it's impaired because it's an illness. And also their judgment is impaired because of that. They have trouble choosing, like, what, what do I do? I don't know up from down mentally. How do, I, how do I know how to go forward? And so it's crippling. So insight's impaired, judgment's impaired, leading to deep vulnerability and a loss of functioning. And so you can imagine if, you, if, you, if your insight's impaired, your judgment's impaired, you, your spiritual life will likely grow faint, you'll be faint-hearted, you'll be frustrated. But are they idle? Again, do they need admonishment or encouragement? Because the answer matters. The wrong treatment, so when admonishment is given instead of encouragement, people are hurt, they're shamed, they're condemned. God's character becomes distorted in their minds. And, you know, there are times when people cover up a lack of responsibility and, and sin issues with a mental illness label. That happens. Uh, I think it's increasingly common amongst young people. Much more can be said on that. But that should never be our default judgment on people who are in distress. Again, think of the third virtue, patience towards all. Allow the fruit of what someone is going through to show itself. And in the meantime, your role is to always be a common counselor. So instead of, again, instead of stepping into this role of ministerial counseling, which requires discernment and ex expertise often, but age and experience, and then you make the wrong judgment and it leads to pain, instead, be a common counselor. Bear with, bear with that person. Be patient with them. Forgive them. Paul finishes here um, with two other buckets of people. He has the idle, the faint-hearted, but then he says, help the weak and be patient toward, towards all. And again, I think those are in that common counseling. Anyone can see someone that's weak and help them. So in conclusion, uh, the four key principles in effective biblical counseling are all Christians are charged to the vital role of common counseling. Two, the necessity of common counseling in the church. Three, effective biblical counseling requires humility, peace, and patience. So three key virtues of the counselor. And lastly, the role of the ministerial counselor in the church in providing differential diagnosis and making sure that people are not damaged by the wrong treatment spiritually. Thank you.